What's up, my beautiful marketing people? Welcome to another episode of the show. Today, joining me is Margaret Kelsey. She is the VP of Marketing at OpenView. Margaret, how you doing? I am doing wonderful. Yesterday, we had like a kiss of fall in the air. Today, it's back to summertime, so we're in this nice little... I don't know, a season of change. I like it. I like it. It's a season of change in many ways. I feel like the world's opening back up. It's it's good. Um, I'm excited to have you on and talk through a couple things um, really about product-led growth, community, brand, content, how they play together, and how to evolve as a manager. But before we get into all of that, I want to take a bunch of steps back and hear how you got to open view walk me through kind of your career journey and how you fell into marketing or chose marketing sure i feel like you could segment my career into uh pre b2b and post b2b and so all of the weird stuff that i did pre b2b um i was in pr for um hotels i was a portrait photographer um i did a little stint in like a tutoring company. Um, and then I found my way to a company called Envision. Um, and I joined around, uh, I was employee number, I think 32 or something like that. Um, and so I was super early at Envision. Um, and that changed the course of my life. I realized that what I really loved to do was content um, and marketing in B2B software companies. And, you know, honestly, when I was in college, I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, so it was it was wonderful to find my way there. And that, um, through the, the rest of my career, I've really just pulled at kind of the next thread that was interesting to me. So after Envision, I found myself at a company uh, in Boston here called AppQs, um, where we did uh, a little bit of a category creation project around product-led growth. We were seeing our, our software was really being used to enable onboarding and, and to drive value through the product that historically was driven by uh, people. So we did this big push around product-led growth, and then OpenView here in Boston as well were actually uh, the folks that coined that term back in 2016, one of our partners, Blake. Um, and so it was a natural progression then to, to grow my career here at OpenView. Amazing. I love that when you kind of find your stride and you're like, oh, content. I kind of went through the same thing where I was like, what do you mean like brands need content and people are searching into Google and I can write a story that and help bring the consumer with me. I'm like, whoa, and people pay for this? Whoa. Like, yeah, yeah it's it's very cool to have and those I, those I, moments. I got my degree in PR and so that was my best try in college at something that was circling around this idea of storytelling. It wasn't quite advertising. I really liked crafting the narrative and the message. Um, and when a couple of years out of college when I when I stumbled upon content marketing as a thing, right when like companies started having blogs and Envision was using their blog for more than just press releases and bottom of the the funnel content, they were using it to really start talking to their end user. Um, and looking back, it's definitely a, a product-led growth company. Uh, we just weren't using that at the time. We were saying design-led, design-driven. Um, and so finding that was was sort of the, the holy grail of, oh, yes, this is what I wanted to do. Amazing. Now, for those who are listening and are like, okay, you guys have said product-led company a couple <laughs> times and maybe yeah. they're not in a you know a product led company let's just kind of like let's set the the foundation here how do you define or yeah uh, yeah i guess define what a product led company is sure um so a product led company is one that is using their product as the the main driver of of growth and so that means uh, onboarding, sales, uh, retention, all of that is happening in the product itself rather than in people teams. Um, so, you know, a big sales team or a big uh, customer success team or whatever it might be. You might still have those teams, um, but it's going to look a lot different. But I think what the real value of product-led growth is, is actually how it aligns teams internally around a single focus. If we're all agreeing that the product is the main source of growth, then marketing doesn't have to be over here doing you know, marketing only projects and products not over there building product itself. All of those teams are talking to one another. All of those teams are usually aligned around similar metrics, which aligns um, activities, it aligns strategy, and it really aligns collaboration. And that's where a lot of growth happens. It's sort of this focus, uh, this impact through focus piece. 
I love it. And for for listeners to think about this, if you think about like early day products, like you know Skype, it's you need someone to Skype with. Hey, I need you to download this program, Mom, so we can talk. Right? Yep. Okay. Product led growth, and then a bunch of companies have obviously uh, have taken that. So I, I love that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and just sorry, oh, exactly what you're talking about with the the ease of adoption is a critical point, right? Product led growth companies usually have a, a very frictionless sign of experience. Usually, you can try the product before you buy it, and that paywall is moved from. Um, from, you know, before you even get into the product to usually after you've adopted the product. And so you think about how that can shift marketing and product and sales teams. Um, It's quite a different business than um, traditional software sales. Yeah, I I love it. I I think it's uh, and different, like you said, getting it fully adopted, having it part of someone's tech stack or repertoire of, of things that they're using to then go, oh, this paid version just makes sense. You know, looking at companies like Slack, for instance, I, we pay Slack happily every month. And the minute I was like, oh, I need the his- the message history. Well, we're so ingrained with Slack. We're not going to change messaging platforms. So let's, um, yeah, let's just pay for it and, and get on with it. Now, there's something interesting here with, with product-led companies and product-led growth. And you, you touched on it there with talking about alignment, right? I think that finding people um, when they come together to be aligned on the goal is so, so important. And I know one of the ways that you like, or we talked a little bit about offline of like looking at growth is um, really the intersection of not only brand message you put out there, but then the content and then also your community and how kind of all of those moving pieces interact. So I'd love to hear you know, how you approach that or think about that. If you're coming in to consult with a new brand or you guys have just funded somebody and you're like, okay, you know, what does that look like for companies in practice? Is it a Slack channel that's brought in that's about a topic? Like where is it building out? It's your own separate internal thing. Like where do companies go when it comes to this? Yeah, Um, I would say most companies too quickly start to create their own community. And so when I talk about community, I'm talking about the community oftentimes that that already exists, right? Like online and social media and lots of other just independent communities have already sprung up. And odds are the people that you're trying to sell to already um, whether in real life or virtually get around a water cooler that already exists. And so you don't As a marketer, especially early on, if it's a small company, small product, you don't have to go first into creating that yourself. It's it's hard work, and it's uh, likely going to fail. Right? You're likely going to have too many conflicting things on your calendar, so you're not going to do the the real job of a community manager and and build that thing. So when I talk about community, I talk about like the big community, um, the community that are already exists. And I think that um, marketers and especially content marketers, as they're starting to think about building a product led business, um, need to tap into this flywheel of brand content and community. And so um, it's, it's a slightly different content strategy than companies have used historically. And it's something that we happened upon. Well, I feel like it was accidental at Envision. Maybe there was a strategy above me that I didn't see. But when I was first working on the blog, for example, I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> I, I was writing for product designers and I was Googling like, what is product design? And so I very quickly, it was not just imposter syndrome. It was absolutely like, being out of my wheelhouse where I'm like, I'm a content marketer, but I don't know, I'm not a subject matter expert. And it's, it's even if I, if I try for the next five years to become the best content marketer slash product designer in the world, I'm not going to be as good as these people that we're trying to sell to, right? What if I just ask them to do my homework for me? What if I just go to them and say, what are you seeing in the market? that nobody's talking about? What do you wish you knew six months ago that you know now that you can tell other people about? Um, And what that did was that creating and and facilitating that content and then publishing that content that was sourced by the community and attributed back to the community then gave Envision the brand credibility that we were in fact the place to go to learn about what was happening in the design industry. And then 
that brand helps fuel that more people are coming to your site and then that community helps fuel more content. And it honestly works even, you know, it's it's not an SEO first approach, but it doesn't negate SEO, right? When you're talking to your community and saying, what are you seeing? They're going to use words that other folks in the community are then searching for. So it's like SEO is kind of baked into the strategy rather than being some other thing of like, now I need to go find these keywords. I need to pretend that I know what I'm talking about. I'm going to Google all this stuff and then try to regurgitate it into like a keyword heavy article that then is going to do well on Google. So it's like a different way of going about the same problem. I like it too, because when you focus on, well, like creating the best piece of content possible. So that means going, getting the experts from the community, getting them to create this amazing piece. Um, that's going to get the right people to read it all the way through. Not just like, you know, you're actually going to get people going through, not just computers and Google being like, oh, this, you know, you've the title tags are great. Um, yeah. And, and page view is cool, but did they bounce? Did they, yeah. did they hit it and say, this is gobbledygook and I, or this is too junior for me. And now I bounced and now I have a, a worse brand impression because this content was crap, you know? Yep. So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's hard to al sometimes align internally around doing the right thing rather than like the thing that has like the vanity metrics. Um, but I would say that this, this strategy is the best that I've seen for building a company that needs the top of funnel volume like a PLG business needs to bring people into the product and, and get enough volume where you're eventually um, monetizing. A thousand percent. You bring incredible experts and that's really um, the content quality is going to take care of itself, right? You just go, hey, I'm going to pay you. I'll, I want to pay you to contribute and do this thing or whatever your agreement is with that with that writer. Um, so I love that. Now, as companies start to grow, right, one of the things we as marketing leaders have to kind of go through is this natural, or maybe unnatural feeling evolution of like, oh, I built my baby. I built this system and it's firing and I'm the conductor of it and I'm organizing, you know, doing all these things. But now I'm bringing in people, you know, um, to run that and I'm moving up to a managerial position. We talk about it on this podcast a lot and it's countless articles on delegate, let go, drop your ego, stop being a control freak. Okay. I, I'm, we're not going to, we're not going to, you know, beat that drum anymore. Um, what I want to talk about is, okay, you did that. You delegated. Now let's talk a little bit about, what you should be after you've kind of gotten rid of the to do, you know, the proverbial and actual to do list that maybe your previous job had, and you're now sitting in this managerial role. Walk me through some of those challenges that you see that either you've had or that you've seen founders or managers as they've evolved uh, that they go through now in this, you know, new position. Yeah, I'll start off by saying I hopefully that somebody is getting to this point. I think oftentimes managers don't even, like they don't delegate to get to this point. So there's a great article, I think it's on First Round's blog about giving up your Legos and it was required reading at AppQ's. Um, one of the co-founders, Jonathan Kim, sent it out to every new hire and was like, you, you must read this, uh, especially as you're starting to grow your career. And uh, I think it's a fantastic read. And I thought I was really good at giving up my Legos. I was pretty sure that I'm a fantastic delegator. I love other people to do my work for me. Um, I was at that part of my uh, managerial, managerial career when I realized that what was happening is I was becoming very uncomfortable with the void that that created in my calendar, in my day, and also in my... Um, my satisfaction at the end of the work day. And what I realized was there is a sense of, I don't know if it's dopamine or whatever it is, of box checking. And so the early in your career, you can go to bed at the end of the night saying, I feel great because I checked all of those boxes. I shipped all of these things. I had this level of impact on a, a, a very short time scale. And as you become a manager, not only do you have to delegate, but you have to become really comfortable with the void that that creates in your calendar. And what you have to do with that void is work on the harder, hairier, more strategic problems that you might 
take three hours of time in your calendar. You might think about a problem and you might not solve it in that day. You might, it might be a week long problem. It might be a month long problem. And if you even think about the chain of command that happens in a, a company, right? By the time a problem gets to the CEO, it's going to be the hardest problem to solve because all the other intelligent people in the organization tried to solve it before you. And so what you need to do is you need to have a calendar that allows for you, that deep thinking, that allows for the ability to, um, to uh, let your brain work in that way. I love that. Like the calendar blocks really... Uh, uh, like I have it in my calendar, for instance, multiple times. Well, one, I have deep work sessions, and then I also have a thinking session on Friday. And it I forget who told me to do it. It was at some article or talk or whatever throughout the time. And it felt very weird to be like, oh, I'm spending time thinking, you know, I'm uh, all throughout the work day. But what yeah. Did does, I do a good job thinking today? <laughs> like it's a totally different – probably a relevant question, but I don't, I think there's probably a better question to ask, but you can't apply that same, uh, did I do good today? Uh, mindset. If your day is about hard strategic problems that usually aren't solved on a short time scale. Yeah. And, and they're not 15 minute or 30 minute or two hour tasks. And it's looking at what are those and pulling yourself out of the minutia and going, okay, what are my potential blind spots here? What are some growth avenues? What are some unexplored avenues? What are some things maybe I, I, I'd like to do, but I don't have the resources for, or I do have the resources for and we haven't tried. And like jotting down, thinking about who would be the right people, all of those things like takes a lot of mental energy, but you have to be in that time frame where you put your phone on silent and put it in your bag and you close down, you close Slack, you like close the text message thing and you're like, all right, I'm going to, Pen and, for me, it's pen and paper. I'm like, I pen and paper everything. Um, and I, ha I have to. Otherwise, I'll get dragged into an email thread. Be like, I need to respond now or I need to do this. And I think it's like not only giving yourself permission, but I, I almost think like pushing yourself like you're being pushed off the diving board into the pool of thinking. Like I need to push myself because it's uncomfortable. It's to be like, no, you're going to sit and you're going to think for three hours. And it's not yeah. like, because I know I've given myself permission, all these things, but I'll always find a task to check off unless I'm like, no, this is important. You need to do it. And uh, it's, that's something it's that's not definitely just, a hurdle. I think it's not, it's not just difficult. It's like, bio, like biologically, we're set up to not do it. So I might butcher this, but there was a, a, a scientific study that was done where they put a bunch of people in a, a room without any stimuli. And the only thing that was there for them to do was to give themselves minor but but relatively painful electric shocks. And the majority of people, when they sit in a room by themselves with no other stimuli, will hit that little button and shock themselves because it's it's easier for them to have some sort of stimuli than it is to just be alone with your thoughts. So if you think about that, if you think about the amount of calories that it takes for a brain to uh, actually activate and use, uh, I'm in the middle of um, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow right now, which is a fantastic book. If you think about what it it's like to change your brain from system one to system two and vice versa, like that is, it is, our brain is trying to get us to not do that. <laughs> our brain is trying to get us to rely on, um, you know, simple, uh, tricks, uh, you know, it, it's trying to get us to not expend that energy. And so it's not just difficult. It's like you're biologically programmed to try to not do it. It's a survival mechanism to let your brain just use its little cheap hacks and get your little dopamine fix and be done with the day. It's also too, like, it's interesting these, your brain and what it does, like, the dissonance that will go through. I, I told my team the other day, I said, cross your arms. And they cross their arms. And for anyone listening to this, I have my arms crossed right now. <laughs> and then I said, okay, now flip them. Flip the other side. And you're, it starts to feel uncomfortable, even though it's the same thing. And I'm yeah. like, that is your brain telling you not to do something. And it, your brain isn't always correct. So it's like having that understanding of what we want to do at a primal level, what we need to do, from a professional development level or from a corporate level or from anything to be like, okay, I need to put myself in this void. I need to get, you know, comfortable in the pocket, however you want to say it, like 
I think that is so, so important. So definitely listeners, make sure you time block, do that, give it a run. Um, definitely tweet me too. If you're like, I just finished my thinking session. I would love to hear about how the, the roller coaster of emotions or anything that happened. Um, Margaret, before I let you go, let people one know where they can learn about open view Two, where they can connect with you online. Sure. So OpenView, you can go to ov.vc or openviewpartners.com, but ov.vc is the the shortcut way to get there. Um, There you can learn more about uh, what stage we like to invest in, the companies we invest in, and and all of that good stuff. You can find me uh, on either LinkedIn or Twitter. Unfortunately, my handle is Margaret Ann K, but it reads like Margaret Tank which I've, I've heard. <laughs> so, uh, I know just, I, it was like four years after I got the handle that somebody was finally like, Oh, Margaret tank. And I was like, mm, not what I was going for, but, um, yeah, find me on, on either Twitter or LinkedIn. I, uh, I'm a lurker. I don't post all that often. I'm trying to get better about, uh, about being out there. So, um, follow and see if it happens. <laughs> Amazing. And I'll put links to, uh, to Margaret's LinkedIn and Twitter on the show notes page so y'all can go and connect with her. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. Very happy to be here. Good chatting. All right, everybody. That's it for this episode. As always, I'm your host, Jordan Shelton, and I'll catch you next time.